So um, what I'm going to talk about is a variety of, of different things where geology and geoscience interfaces with social science. And it, it's not really a, a kind of um, full um, record of what BGS does. It's just what I thought was particularly important for, for today. So there are three things which I, th I think I will I hope you'll find interesting. The first one is uh, managing underground space. So it's really about um, understanding how the different ways that you might use the subsurface, the underground, interfere with each other, or how they interface with each other, or how they affect each other. And that might sound very esoteric and uninteresting, but in fact, um, we are beginning to use the underground much more in lots of different ways. If you've ever been to Hong Kong, I was there recently, it's extraordinary how in Hong Kong they're using the subsurface. The same in Singapore, the same in very cold places, for example, in the parts of the northern United States and Alaska, a lot of stuff is underground now. I also talk a bit about energy transitions, and I think this is perhaps the most, um, at least interesting area for me, because I think the social sciences are heavily underused in work in energy transitions and climate change, so I hope to talk about that. The last one's very close to my heart, because as chief scientist of the British Geological Survey, I am a kind of spokesman for the science of the U of UK and UK geoscience and BGS geoscience, and I often get stuck in front of cameras um, talking about unpleasant things like shale gas and um, nuclear waste disposal, and I often find myself, you know, very nervous and very stressed, having a camera stuck in my face, and I often make mistakes when I try to communicate. I try to say things about geology, and I find that people don't understand what I'm saying or they take it wrong, or whatever. And I think that's really important now. I mean, geoscientists particularly are beginning to realise how badly we communicate. I'm sure you'll find that out today. Um, anyway, managing underground space. So first of all, uh, the space in the underground is getting incredibly crowded and busy. This is a photograph from a bit of uh, uh, sort of uh, infrastructure work in London when they were digging up part of a street in London, just the amount of infrastructure in our cities just under the surface is phenomenal. It's everywhere, it's telecommunications, gas, electric, and it's all stuck in these very narrow corridors, and it's incredibly important for keeping our cities going. And really, we don't often know exactly where these things are, and uh, we certainly don't know how to exploit other parts of the space in the underground to use these, these, these sort of infrastructural developments. Um, you know, you can get kind of uh, visualizations like this, which show just how crowded the streets are underneath, with with infrastructure and equipment and uh, pipelines and <coughs> what have you. And you can also get these. I don't know if you've seen these wonderful coloured books, um, sort of coffee table books, which show you the infrastructure of cities from underneath rather than from above. And some of them almost go down as far below uh, as they do above in places like Hong Kong and Singapore and Shanghai. They're going to be beginning to look like that. And managing this is a real nightmare because if you're trying to build an enormous building or if you're trying to stick a, a new tube line through central London, you've got to really be careful how you stick that tunnel because if the tunnel is going in the wrong place even by a few centimetres, you can cause major problems. So this is extremely intense use of the subsurface. There's also more less intense but nevertheless very large-scale uses of subsurface, like the crowded underground offshore. So we could do in the future have, and this, by the way, is a piece of subsurface geology in the North Sea. It's an actual bit of the uh, Sherwood Sandstone Group, which um, goes out in the North Sea. It's, the Sherwood Sandstone Group has been thought of as a really good place for lots of geological activity, like carbon capture and storage, for example. So storing CO2, if you're familiar with this, from the atmosphere in the underground. There's also, and that, that's the kind of pressure wave that, that would happen if you stored CO2 in the underground. So that pressure wave will move out and affect other things that are being done in the subsurface. So you might need to manage that carbon capture and storage. You might also be storing gas out there in the North Sea, because in the UK we need to store gas, um, because uh, you know sometimes we don't have enough of it and we need to pull it out of the ground and burn it, uh, because we don't want to spend enormous amounts of money on gas that's being sold to us on the open market. Enhanced oil recovery we might be doing out in the North Sea in the future. 
we might perish the thought be doing underground coal gasification out in the North Sea in coal seams that no one would ever mind. I don't think that will ever happen. But that is a pretty busy piece of North Sea. You would think that North Sea is pretty empty, but it, in the subsurface it could be really quite busy out there. Geothermal from old wells, that's another one. Here's a, a, a picture close to my heart in the sense that I've sweated buckets over this one, but this is a picture of Britain's main shale gas resource area. So the two colours are an upper and a lower layer of shale. Uh, and it shows you where that shale is. And look where it is. It's right underneath cities, basically. It's underneath cities, high value, ag high value agricultural land, or it's under, it's under national parks. And that's the chief problem with shale gas, really. It's not that it's difficult to get out or we don't know how much there is. It's the fact that it's sitting under an extremely busy sort of surface world and therefore it needs a very, very high level of environmental assurance to be able to develop it. And I don't know if we're ever going to achieve that level to the satisfaction of the public, particularly. So that's an example of the ground, underground becoming crowded and how it interfaces with the, with the surface, which is a very sensitive topic. Some basic other things. Here's some examples. Probably you don't realise how much gas storage is, is done on, onshore and offshore in the UK. There are many, many places where gas is stored, natural gas, in the UK, in salt mines, in salt areas, in, in sandstones and in, in aquifers. And this is a very... Already we use the subsurface a lot for storing things like gas. Here's a nice uh, graph that shows you, or a diagram that shows you, how we might use underground and where the depths, what kind of depths you'd expect. So, for example, for working in stores and offices, you know, people will regularly go under 10 metres underground. Public use, things like stations, tube stations, recreation, culture. I don't know what kind of recreation goes on at 20 metres below the surface, but... In my storage, industry, production, industrial spaces, and way out towards in technical infrastructure, we've got things like tunnels, fuel storage tanks, and then geothermal energy, CO2 storage, salt caverns down at you know, 2,000, 250 metres, 300 metres, even deeper. And that shows you the sort of spectrum of depths that we're working at. So it's every depth, really, down to um, sort of depths which are rather difficult to, to access. This is a rather dense slide, but I thought I'd shove these in anyway for, for completeness. But <coughs> some others, so distribution and thickness of aquifers, groundwater management, groundwater flooding, pr flood protection, nuclear waste disposal, um, hydrocarbons, land use planning, local decision making, civil engineering. We are using the subsurface, believe me, uh, an enormously in, uh, in increased, in an in normally in increased way and in more intensively than ever before. So rather than go on about generalities, I thought I'd give you some detailed examples which help your, your legal minds and um, maybe slightly um, interest your legal minds and think about the, you know, what, what these implications are. Because us geologists, we're simple folk. We really think about the rocks down there, but we, we don't really think about the ownership and the implications so much. So we need you to help us. But here's a good one. So shale gas, how far can a fracture go? So I, uh, I went to the shale gas, uh, the shale gas uh, site in the United States, sorry, in Canada a few years ago. I went to uh, Sir Mark Walport, then the chief uh, government scientist, uh, as an advisor to him on shale gas. And uh, we went to this place it's called Fox Creek in Alberta. And there they're fracking for gas. And these are the frack trucks. If you like big trucks, it's a great place to see uh, big trucks and blokes in yellow hats and high-vis jackets. It's the noisiest thing I've ever seen. I mean, absolutely incredible noise, you know. The noise is that pulverizes you, you know. You need these sort of ear protectors when, when they're actually fracking because the pressure that they use and these trucks produce the pressure to squirt the water down and to crack the rocks and they crack the rocks deep down and the gas comes out. So that's really what shale gas is. And you might think, so what? Well, here in the UK, as I said, we're really dealing with a matter of where you can do this and where it's safe to do it. And, uh, and what that really hinges upon, in, in many ways, is how far a fracture that you generate using this high-pressure water can actually go. And can it go a long way, in which case, if it can, 
can it therefore connect with an other, an old fracture or a natural fracture in the ground and bring gas to the surface? Or could it connect with an old well, an old oil and gas well that you might not know about, which might be there? Or if there's a fault, because a fault, a geological crack in the earth can allow gas to move through it sometimes, how close to a fault should you be able to run a hydraulic fracturing experiment? At the moment, there's no legal basis to that in the UK. It's simply done on its own. It's done by a, on a case-to-case, -case, on a case-to-case -case basis. So essentially, if a company wants to do it, it has to present a plan to the government, and the government looks at the plan, and the government says, OK, you can frack, or you can't frack. But essentially, we don't really know how far a fracture can go. We don't know really what governs the speed it goes at or how far it can actually move. So should it be within one mile of a fault or should it be within half a mile of a fault? Should it be 100 metres from a fault? And that's so important because essentially it's dividing up the land and you know, making it, reducing the area at which you can actually frack. So that's a scientific problem which has surely got to be turned into a regulatory issue in the sense that we as scientists ought to come up with something that's realistic that a regulator can install into regulations so that the, the public is protected. At the moment that's not really done. And it's really hard science actually. It's very physical, um, I don't mean physical, picking things up, I mean it's physics and chemistry. It's really difficult science. Here's another one. So carbon capture and storage I mentioned earlier on. If you're not familiar with it, it's really about taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it into the ground, mainly from power stations. In the UK, we've got a lot of rocks which could be suitable for it, particularly out in the North Sea. And here in Scotland, um, you have a group that particularly powerfully supports and advocates this in Edinburgh. Essentially, what you're going to have to do is, if you operate one of these disposal sites, is dispose of carbon dioxide, like that, by drilling a hole, into the rocks, in a place like that, whoops. And then you're going to fill it up. And you're going to fill it up for as long as you think that rock will take the CO2. And you may want to do it for 20 years or 30 years. And maybe you want to put the results of 50 power stations running for 10 years into that storage rock, okay, or disposal site. Now what happens then, when you've finished, and when you feel that it's full, you have to put a cap on the top of the well, and you have to put cement in the well so the CO2 will never leak out. But who is responsible for that store once you've done that? Can you rely on a company that has done it? And this might be BP or Shell or someone else. Can you rely on a company being a company for 500 years and continuously committing to maintaining it? and making sure that it, and monitoring it. Probably not. What you probably have to do is hand it over to a competent authority. This is why I get scared talking to a load of lawyers, but essentially you have to hand it over to a government, generally, and the government has to agree that that is a site which is pretty well safe and that we as a government will look after it and, and under, uh, you know, in perpetuity for the public's um, safety. But of course, to do that, you have to hand it over at a point where a government is comfortable with the liability. So this is covered by, and this may have changed slightly, but this has been covered by the CCS Directive. Um, and what the CCF, CCS Directive says is that you have to develop a geological model, which is very, very sophisticated, which shows how the CO2 is moving, shows that you know where the CO2 is in the subsurface, and crucially, that you can predict exactly what is going to happen with that CO2 for the next 300 years. If you can't show that, then the government w or the competent authority will not take it on, essentially. I mean, there are parallels in the nuclear industry and lots of other industries, but it's an example where geology comes very close up to these sort of technical legal problems. And is the model fit for purpose? Yes, you get a storage permit. Is the ejection behaving as the model predicted? Yes, you can continue injecting 
After 50 years, is the store behaving as the model predicted? Yes, you can close the store and hand over liability to government. Really a difficult thing. Here's another one, which is quite interesting. One thing is that peop people don't realize is the heat under the ground that we all would like to use, the geothermal heat, isn't actually licensed in the UK. And I, I'm not sure what that means legally, but I suspect it means that nobody owns it. I'm sure you could probably um, tell me perhaps better, but essentially we don't really have a system for dealing with the heat that's there in the subsurface. And there's a quite a lot of it. Um, and in you know, the city of London, they're using it more and more, um, not only for heating, but for cooling. It's quite sophisticated technology. But essentially, if somebody does a load of wells there, and then there's a load of wells here, and then here as well, they're going to be stealing each other's heat, probably. And they're probably going to reduce or extract the heat at a rate that it will not be sustainable, because it won't be replenished. But essentially, you're mining the heat. So this is another difficult geological question. How much heat is there? Um, is there enough to sustain lots of air conditioning you know, in the city of London? Yes or no? Are you extracting it at a rate which is sustainable? If you're not, then really you shouldn't be doing it because it's not going to be you know, in the long term any use. And thirdly, what's the best technology to, exclude, uh, to extract it you know, and efficiently extract it? So this is a really interesting one. And we are nowhere with this sort of thing, to my knowledge at least. Here's another one. I think there's some groundwater people here, some hydrogeologists. So I think this is particularly interesting. Um, so a long slide, but essentially groundwater, I think, is emerging as an incredibly important future asset. It's already incredibly important, but it's going to be incredibly important in parts of the world where climate change will reduce surface water. And we know from modelling, which is not on this slide, I thought it was, we know from modelling that East African surface water, for example, will decline hugely in certain areas. What that means is that large numbers of people in East Africa, there are 200 million people at the moment, there's going to be 1,000 million by 2090 in East Africa, are going to be relying on water that's not there. And they're going to have to go into the ground for it. And groundwater is generally considered to be the buffer for climate change for many people. It's going to be the thing that helps them survive because they're not going to have the surface water. But at the moment, surprisingly enough, we don't really know, in Africa particularly, what the rates of recharge are, where the recharge areas are, how fast you can extract water without causing problems with sustainability. At the moment, we're heading into a massive car crash because we don't know, you know how people are going to survive with, with these problems. Groundwater's there to help us survive, particularly East African developing countries and other developing countries, survive climate change. But if we don't understand it, then we can't help. But I think this is particularly interesting. And that is, this is a graph produced, uh, sorry, a map produced by the World Bank recently, a very interesting report called High and Dry, where they published this map that shows how large areas of or large catchments tend to be very international, particularly in Africa, the cross-border. And that really means that groundwater is cross-border. I know there are some people in the audience who work on cross-border groundwater, but essentially we don't really know, um, or there's not enough work done on how abstraction of water either sides of borders can be controlled. And that's another difficult one. Here's a final one, uh, perhaps one of the thorniest ones of all. Here in the UK, we have a hundred, sorry, we have 50 or 60 years worth of civil nuclear waste uh, from our nuclear program. It's sitting at the surface at the moment in Sellafield in tanks. What are we going to do with it? Well, most people think we should stick it under the ground, out of harm's way. There are arguments about to and, to and fro about that. But that is what a radioactive waste facility might look like. And that has got to be safe for a very long time into the future thousands and thousands of years, if not millions of years. Uh, we've got to understand all the things that might affect that. So we've got to develop a case, a safety case, on the basis of that. Is there going to be future seismic activity? Is there going to be glaciation in 10,000 years, 20,000, 30, 40, 50,000 years? Is there going to be uplift and erosion? 
Is there going to be climate change, including sea level rise? What about permafrost? What does that do when you've got deep geological waste facility? Um, we can predict some things. So st statistically, this is an interesting one. This is a statistical model of um, future seismicity based on what we know about past British seismicity. See here where the hotspots are. We live in somewhere like Menai Straits. You know, that's where future seismic activity is more likely. Interesting enough, there's a nuclear power station in Anglesey, but never mind. But you can do some of this work, but it, you can do it 2,000 years in the future, but doing a million years into the future is really, really difficult. And yet we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to bury this waste. I think this is a really interesting one, which is what do you do when you've made one of these nuclear waste facilities? For when people are coming along in 100,000 years, you know, it's a bit like um, Time Traveller by H.G. Wells. What, how do you make it clear that there's something down there to people that are so far in the future that probably won't speak the language we speak, they don't understand the symbols and signs we understand? They may be incredibly advanced people. They may just be energy forces, like on Star Trek or something, or <laughs> speaking, you know, they, but they're probably <coughs> physical bodies like us, and they probably need to know that there's something there. How are you going to mark it? This is really interesting. So there are some people say you stick a pyramid on the top with lots of signs that people will understand whether they are, you know, whether they speak English or not, you know, skulls and crossbones and things like that. But we, I mean, it's, it's funny, but it's true. Because we're going to have to do this. So what, how do we do this? There's a social science question for you. So I'm going to just briefly look at energy transitions for a second. Um, so I'm very interested in this. It has a very geological angle. And sorry for showing you a load of graphs, but it, if you look at this, this is from a very nice paper about how in the past few hundred years, the world has moved from essentially a wood economy, if you like, a wood energy economy, to a coal economy, and then to an oil and natural gas economy. Very, very simple way of looking at it. But essentially, we began with wood, we turned to coal, and then we turned to oil and gas. And now we're trying to turn to renewables. That's an incredibly crude way of characterizing it. But there's some truth in it. Here's another way of representing the same transition. We started from zero carbon, in other words, wood, in about, say, 1850. We moved catastrophically towards coal through a period between about 1850 and 19. That was called the Industrial Revolution. Then we wiggled around following oil and gas. And now we may turn another direction. We may completely disappear off that triangle. We might go into a hydrogen economy. These are what en energy transitions are all about. And these are really interesting because they involve social science, they involve history, they involve social changes in Britain. We were already a coal-burning nation by 1700. We had already shifted to fossil fuels by 1700. We already burned more coal than wood then. It became an important part of British life. We began in the Industrial Revolution essentially to replace water well, well water mills, with steam-driven or coal-driven cotton mills. So at a, a point in industrial history, we essentially turned from a, 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 a country or an economy which was dependent on the surface ecological limits, in other words, the fall of water, to one that depended on the amount of coal that you could shovel into a, 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 a steam-driven uh, machine. There's a great book on this called Fossil Capital, which links capitalism and climate change and the fossil economy and blames it all on the British. It's amazing. <laughs> Don't read it if you're a... Uh, you know, I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's a great book. But it's fascinating. And it's really very geological because the reason why this happened is partly because we had coal at the surface. It was easy to get and it was pretty high quality. In Scotland, that's certainly the case. But in other parts of the UK, you could argue that's why the Industrial Revolution happened and there were other things. But it's very geological. Of course, that had a massive effect. While all these wonderful things were happening, in 1769, this is the patenting of the steam engine by Watt, we've got this enormous increase in CO2 emissions. So CO2 is directly linked to the, the take-up of industri the Industrial Revolution. So energy transition like that from essentially wood to coal linked enormously to changes in the atmosphere. 
and also to discussions on things like the Anthropocene. So me as a scientist, as a geological scientist, I'm very used to thinking about transitions and climate change, particularly from the point of view of tipping points and positive feedback loops. So anybody who reads the papers about climate change knows about the ice albedo effect, methane hydrate release, Amazon forest decay. These are all positive feedbacks which accelerate climate change, which make climate change worse and can tip it over into catastrophic problems, so at, at a tipping point. And these can be illustrated in various ways. This is a nice diagram that shows how the system may be resilient in the sense that this ball can move in this space here. If you move it up and down, it'll wiggle up and down. But if you cause a catastrophic jump, it will jump into another system, and that's a tipping point. So that's one way of looking at it. And scientists, and physical scientists particularly, climate scientists, will see it in terms of the physico-chemical changes, the big Earth systems that control climate change. But what's really fascinating is if you start looking at transitions, energy tra transitions like the, uh, the Industrial Revolution, they're full of tipping points and positive feedback loops. So for example, one of the reasons why the Industrial Revolution went so fast was because the steam engine enabled you could to go deeper to mine more coal because you could pump water out of the mines. Plus, you could use machinery to pull the coal out. So essentially, coal fed itself. It made itself more fast. It made itself go faster. The same with coal to oil uh, in Pennsylvania, when oil really began to develop in about 1870, 1869 in Pennsylvania in the United States. Oil from Pennsylvania, gas from Pennsylvania, began to be fed into the steel mills. So Pennsylvania developed more steel. The steel developed, and made the Industrial Revolution stronger. Henry Ford came along in about 1908, I think, 1905, started producing cars, which, hey, presto, could use the petrol that was being produced by these oil wells. So you get this amazing positive feedback loop. And it's interesting that really this thing happens in the, in the socioeconomic world. We've got the same thing happening, positive feedback loops jumping over into other sorts of systems. So the Industrial Revolution, you could argue, is that. An energy transition is simply doing that, jumping over that jump into another. So you're going from coal to wood to coal or wood to oil. And I think that scientists generally, in the physical science, climate change world, don't really think about this enough. They don't realize that we've gone through energy transitions which have affected the climate. And we don't, and they don't talk to the social scientists and economists who understand the feedback loops and the things that make changes go faster. And I think there's a really important bringing together. I'm sure it happens, but I don't think it's seen particularly as a, as a joint problem. And I think it really is a joint problem. So I, I would say that people should think about that. And the last one, which I'm uh, going to go through fairly quickly. As I said, I'm, I'm often ha having to talk, uh, communicate to, to ordinary people about energy things. I often have to talk about geothermal or shale gas or carbon capture storage. Compressed air energy storage, hydrogen storage. And I think the underground is really important for the air, low carbon transition, for that change from the oil economy into the renewables economy. Maybe not that, but certainly the other ones. But actually, we have real trouble as geologists communicating this. Quite often, you open your mouth and you start talking about boreholes or supercritical CO2 or radioactive waste. And people get very, very scared. There seems to be a particular thing about the subsurface or the underground that people don't like. We have a real problem. One of the things that we tend to do, as I'm doing it right now, is that scientists, when they talk to people, they tend to get graphs out. and They, they tend to get microphones out and they start talking to people. And they treat people like something to lecture to. And we quite often miss the point. When we're trying to explain to people, ordinary people, maybe not people like yourselves, but people who are not particularly scientifically or you know, socially science interested, uh, we bang on about technical accuracy. We, we bring out our slides. We try to do this. And there's some a couple of papers that are particularly noting this in the sensitive geological areas like shale gas. This is a paper published a few weeks ago by Ian Stewart, the famous TV geologist that you may have seen around. Um, we're obsessed with technical ac accuracy. 
And this seems to derive from what they call a deficit model of science communication, which is this idea that essentially what we're trying to do is fill in the public all they need to know in order to be as good as we are and understanding things. You know, in, in other words, trying to turn everyone into a scientist or a specialist so that they can make an informed decision. So it's assuming that we kind of have to teach them, teach people, get out the graphs, get out the... And there's a lot going on about this, and very interesting things about how scientists think too little about how the public think or feel. Academics need to question with humility their own deficit model of the public understanding of politics. This is maybe Ruth Dixon's people doing very interesting in this. This deficit model actually came from the Royal Society. Um, Yeah. Okay, so, um, however, it's very interesting. Um, this is an article by um, a writer about public, she was particularly interested by the Trump um, phenomenon. And she was commenting in this article that there are areas of science where communication really does get through really, really quickly and really easily. And those tend to be in these lovely areas, you know, everybody likes, you know, everybody likes him, and they love to watch <laughs> this stuff, you know, and, and, he, and he's, he's so full of wonder and everything, and, and who could not like watching stuff about Mars and the universe and the planets and stuff, and quirky animal behaviour is, is very familiar, it's, it's really nice to watch it, but uh, unfortunately people like me don't live in this world, and it's a sense most scientists don't, most of us live in this sort of world, health, climate research, GM crops, shale gas. And it's not full of wonder. It's really important and people have to understand it and understand it enough to make the democratic process work so we make the right decisions. But in fact, it's very hard to live in this world and, and, and talk to people. It's applied science. It's close to the immediate concerns of the public. It's incre incremental. It changes. It adds to itself. It sometimes contradicts itself, which is a terrible problem for the public because they don't like that. Even though it's part of the scientific process, it's easily politicised, and all of those are incredibly easily politicised. Here's an example: health. You know, it's either fat's terrible for you, or it's really good for you. First, fat was bad; now it's sugar. How can we believe them when they keep changing their minds? This is really common, and it kind of erodes the authority of scientists, and it's very sort of cherry picking. They're very difficult to deal with. There are organisations that help, like the Science Media Centre. I don't know if you've heard of them, they're essentially a, a group that will gather scientists together over a particular topic to try and communicate and they'll bring a load of journalists from the big newspapers, not the little ones because they never come. So you get the Sunday Times and the Guardian and stuff and they'll come and listen to the scientists and really, really understand and then they report better, they report more sensibly. So it can be done, it's not a, a massive problem. And this is, the, I suppose, the final slide that I make a point on and that's um, I'm really interested in this. I'm doing a, a very unusual event, I think, on the 15th of November in Dublin. Uh, I hope you'd be interested in coming. So I'm, I'm very interested in poetry, and I've, I've been a fan of Seamus, Seamus Heaney, the Irish poet, uh, since I was about 18 years old. And I've always admired his poetry about fossils, and particularly good at describing fossils, particularly the bodies that are found in the bogs of Ireland. They're amazing poems, if you ever have a chance to read them, they're brilliant. And he's brilliant at describing what paleontologists find it hard to describe. And he does it as a poet in an extraordinary way. He simply uses language in a way that immediately you get it, whether you're a paleontologist or not. He can describe how fossils are preserved, how time passes, how long time is. And these are things we as Geologists find it incredibly hard to describe to the public. We use things like clocks that when it's five to midnight, midnight and you know, you know, that man has appeared and things. But he does it in a very simple, almost sort of, you know, folksy way. And I'm fascinated by this. And I think that the use of metaphor, imagery, using metaphor and imagery in a very consistent way, rather than using it as we do, you know, haphazardly, is a very powerful way of describing. I think we get our graphs out too soon, and I think we talk too complicated too quickly. And I think we should probably learn from people who know. So essentially what I'm doing in November is I'm 
sitting with a poet, uh, a guy called Egan e McGovern, quite a well-known Irish poet. And he and I are going to discuss the poetry of Seamus Heaney. I'm going to describe how, how he uses his poetry to naturally show how preservation happens and how, how time is very, very slow moving, for example. And Iggy will read the poems. And then we're going to show the, the bodies because they're actually in the museum. So we're going into the next room where some of these Irish bog bodies will be actually on display. So it may be an interesting event. Anyway, so conclusion. So use of understanding has expanded considerably. We have to understand competing uses interfere with each other and lots of single cumulative environmental effects. So having lots of shale gas wells rather than one. You know. Modern and old energy transitions are very interesting because in fact we see the same things played over and over again. And I think there's a really big role for social science, economic science, in understanding energy transitions and climate change because they're very much linked. At the moment it's too much seen as a physical science issue. It's not at all. Because you know, if you get something that makes something else happen in the you know, in the industrial world, that makes, you know, climate change faster. It's not a physical science process, it's a human process. And I think humans we should be talking the physical scientists and the social scientists. And finally I think there's a lot to learn by geologists about how to communicate. And I think we could probably go to the arts particularly to do that and do it much better. Ah, yes. Final plug. So if you're interested in anything I've said today, it's very much coming from a new book that's published next year in March by Elsevier. Okay, I'll leave it up there. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much.